Hi everyone, I'm Jacob Lackner, and it's Thursday, so that means it's time for another history video. As usual, I ran a poll last week to determine the topic of this week's video, and people most wanted to see a video on Crusader art and architecture, so that's the topic for today. I already did a video on this channel that looked at the culture of the Crusader states, and this is definitely a companion piece to that, in the sense that that video really took a look at primary sources that described Crusader culture, and in that video, we saw that they were taking on the traits of people who lived in the vicinity, learning local languages, and so on. This video will show another area where the Crusaders were culturally affected by their surroundings, art, and architecture, both of which would combine Western European styles with local styles in the Crusader states. Now, the purpose of this video is not for me to go crazy in depth on Crusader art and architecture. This video is more of an introduction to Crusader art and architecture than it is an exhaustive survey of it. This video will have three main parts. First, I'm gonna give you some background information about the Crusades. Second, we're going to take a look at Crusader architecture. And third, we're going to take a look at Crusader art. So let's start with some brief background information on the Crusades and the Crusader states. The first crusade was announced by Pope Urban II in 1095, and it began in 1096. The goal of the crusade was primarily to help the Byzantine emperor take back land he had lost to the Seljuk Turks. Another motivating factor was taking back Jerusalem so that Christians in the West could more easily make pilgrimages there. Ultimately, this crusade was surprisingly successful, managing to conquer a large swath of mostly coastal territory as far north as southeastern Asia Minor and as far south as the Red Sea. Once these conquests had succeeded, the Crusaders didn't simply go back to Western Europe. Many of them stayed there, and entire generations of people with Western European roots grew up in these Crusader states, and this resulted in the creation of a unique culture. There would be at least some presence of Western Europeans in the region from 1099 all the way until 1291. Again, in the earlier video, we took a look at how outsiders reacted to the people that they found living in these Crusader states, and in general, they seem to have experienced culture shock. That's because the people who lived there weren't just Western Europeans who happened to live in the Middle East, they had their own culture entirely. And this is very clearly reflected in the artistic and architectural developments in the Crusader states. All right, so let's take a look at architecture, as this seems to be the area that was the most immediately impacted. There are two main types of structures that the Crusaders encountered as early as the First Crusade, and this had a profound impact on how they built their own buildings. There are both religious structures and defensive structures that influence them. Let's start with the religious ones. First, let's talk about what religious buildings in Europe looked like at the time of the First Crusade. So when the Crusaders left Europe, they left behind buildings built using what is called the Romanesque style. This style sought to revive some aspects of ancient Roman architecture, in particular, the use of arches and pillars. They also featured some circular structures that are sort of like small domes, but they generally had pointed tops. These churches were large stone constructions, but nowhere near the size of the more famous Gothic churches that would be built later on in the medieval period. Even before the advent of the Romanesque style, churches in medieval Europe had almost exclusively been built using what is called a basilica floor plan, and this had been true since at least the 4th century. This type of floor plan gets its name from a type of building that Romans actually built as a sort of assembly hall. Churches were given the same design as being rectangular and containing a large area for people to gather in made a lot of sense. And remember, those early Christians are living in a Roman world. Most of them just are Romans, so certainly they are impacted by their Roman surroundings. Christians did make one change to the basilican structure, and that was that they tended to make them shaped like crosses for obvious reasons. So that's what buildings in Western Europe looked like at the time of the First Crusade, but the Crusade itself would introduce Western Europeans to some very different buildings. The First Crusade was scheduled to meet up in Constantinople in 1097, and many of the Crusaders spent significant time there because they were all waiting around for other crusading armies to show up. And when they did get there, they saw a city far larger than anything they had experienced in Western Europe. They saw the city's impressive defensive fortifications, more on them later, and they saw the kind of architecture that the Byzantines were using for their religious buildings. The building that awed them the most was Hagia Sophia, a church that was built during the 6th century by Emperor Justinian. The building was on a scale that no medieval building in the West had achieved or even come close to achieving, and the scale of the building wasn't the only thing that was awe-inspiring to the Crusaders. Hagia Sophia also had a massive dome as a central feature. We did see that in Romanesque architecture there are structures somewhat similar to domes, but as we saw they're both pointed and very small, and not really a central feature of the building. That is not the case with Hagia Sophia. 
Byzantine churches, with Hagia Sophia the most awe-inspiring example, featured huge domes that were the center of the building. In short, instead of using the basilican structure that was used in the West, Byzantine churches used what is called a central plan, with a dome as the central feature of the church. Then, once the Crusaders had conquered Jerusalem, they encountered another building that used a centralized plan, the Dome of the Rock, which had been built in the 630s, not long after Muslim conquest of the city. It is a shrine that houses a cliff face, or rock, that has a number of different significances. In particular, it is the place thought to be where the creation of the earth began, the place where Abraham went to sacrifice his child, which child depends on your faith, and for Muslims, also the place where Muhammad ascended to heaven after his night journey. These domes clearly made an impact on the Crusaders, who, once they began constructing and renovating their own buildings in the Crusader states, began shifting towards utilizing this central plan structure, in addition to gaining greater mastery of the techniques necessary to build huge domes, as opposed to the much smaller pointed ones of the Romanesque architecture. The most notable example of this was the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This is a massive church complex in Jerusalem that is believed to house both Christ's tomb and the site of his crucifixion. The church had been destroyed in the early 11th century by an extremist Muslim ruler named Al-Hakam, and while it was rebuilt after he died, it was a much more modest version than the earlier one had been. The earlier one had been built by Constantine's mother, Helena, in the 4th century, and it was absolutely massive. So, once the Crusaders conquered the city, perhaps feeling somewhat jealous of the Muslim buildings in Jerusalem and the Church of Hagia Sophia, they renovated the church in a big way, making it much larger and making it more centralized, especially the portion of the church that contains Christ's tomb. And of course, this involved adding a bunch of domes to the building. Another, less monumental structure that was built in Jerusalem was on the site where Christ was thought to have ascended to heaven. This Chapel of the Ascension, which sits on the Mount of Olives, is another centralized and dome building built during the Crusader period. It's worth noting that it stands directly opposite the Temple Mount, which holds the Dome of the Rock, which Muslims believe is the place where Muhammad ascended to heaven, so there's definitely a bit of architectural competition going on here. This use of domes and centralized buildings ultimately made its way into Western Europe, though it was mostly reserved to be used for baptistries as opposed to churches themselves. There are a few exceptions to this, though, as other medieval central plan buildings can be found in both England and France, with Temple Church being the most notable example. It makes sense that those who built this church would use a crusader style. After all, it was built by the Templars, a knightly order that was born in Jerusalem. All right, let's talk now about how the defensive structures of Crusaders and then Western Europeans changed as a result of contact with other cultures. Just like when we talked about the architecture that the Crusaders left behind in Europe, it is necessary to also discuss what defensive structures looked like in late 11th century Europe too, so we can fully appreciate how much they changed. When you think of a stereotypical medieval castle, you're mostly thinking of buildings that were built only after Western Europeans came into contact with Eastern structures. The one exception to this is the Normans, who did build some castle-like structures in northern France and England even before the Crusade, but even their castles are nothing compared to the massive scale of later ones. The reason for this, too, was that the Normans came into contact with Muslim and Byzantine architecture before most Europeans, as they had a significant presence in southern Italy well before the First Crusade. Anyway, most fortified towns in the 11th century did not use stone walls, but those made of wood. They were built on what is called a moat and bailey structure, which generally meant that the town was surrounded by a defensive ditch, and there would be a drawbridge that would close each night to keep people out. Meanwhile, the Lord's Keep, or basically small fortified structure, sometimes made of stone but usually made of wood, this keep stood on top of a moat, an artificial hill. If the town was attacked, the Lord would evacuate people into his keep, which it would be very difficult for anyone to get to as a result of the artificial hill. In general, though, siege warfare wasn't that common in the West before the First Crusade, where most battles were decided on the open field. So that's how most Western Europeans fortified things up until the 11th century, and you can immediately see this probably is not what you think of when you think of a medieval fortified town. When the Crusaders went east, though, they encountered many fortified structures very different from their own. As I mentioned earlier, Constantinople had absolutely massive walls that encircled the city, something far more sturdy than the wooden stockade walls that were being utilized by Western Europeans. The Byzantine Emperor actually sent two of his best siege engineers with the Crusaders once they left Constantinople, and this is because the Crusaders had no experience besieging cities with similar fortifications. 
Every city they had captured had huge walls, so the Crusaders were very much out of their element. Their main strength was their cavalry charge, and that really isn't that useful when you're besieging a city. The Crusaders pretty much had to learn on the job as they marched through Asia Minor and the Levant. This makes their ultimate victory all the more impressive, as they were engaged in a style of warfare that was very new to them. They also encountered several large castles in Asia Minor, both those built by the Byzantines and those built by Muslim rulers in the region. You can see that these castles are more like what you think of when you think of a medieval castle. Once the Crusaders had succeeded with their series of conquests and set up the Crusader states, they displayed a mastery of this new style of defensive structures and even built a massive network of castles to protect their borders. While Crusader walls were generally not significantly different than those built by Muslim or Byzantine rulers, they did put their own spin on castles, building them on an even larger scale than those of their contemporaries. And after all of this, castles really became the focal point of power for the nobility in the Crusader states, as possessing one of them gave you a great deal of power and control of the surrounding region. Obviously, this move towards stone fortifications and siege warfare had major ramifications in Europe, where that same kind of warfare gradually became the norm, resulting in all of those stereotypical medieval castles you're thinking of. Let's move now to art. In particular, I want to focus on painting, which in this time period is mostly limited to manuscript illustrations. So, like we did with architecture, let's take a look at the artistic style that was popular in Western Europe at the time of the First Crusade. Like we saw with architecture, the style of painting at the time was also called Romanesque, and it involved more of an emphasis on realism than earlier medieval styles did. However, it had some rather distinct characteristics that kept it from achieving a style of figural art that actually represented the way that people looked. Most notably, figures in most Romanesque manuscripts are incredibly elongated, as you can see here. They have ovular bodies, rather small heads, and huge hands and feet. Once the Crusaders settled in the Holy Land, they began to realize that the style of figural art of the local artists was significantly different. In particular, Byzantine, Syrian, and Armenian artists were a lot closer to creating realistic figures that had realistic proportions. Some other common characteristics of this type of art was also the heavy use of gold leaf. This is when literal shavings of gold are used in an image, and it was often used in the background, as you can see in the examples I'm showing you. Another common characteristic of figural art is incredibly wavy clothing, as you can see in these images. This style of art appealed to many who settled in the Crusader states, and most work commissioned by the Western Christian nobility reflected this style. The best preserved example of this is the Psalter of Melisend of Jerusalem. Melisend was Queen of Jerusalem from 1131 to 1161. Her life is also a good indicator of the types of cultural interaction that were going on at the time. Her father, Baldwin II, was the ruler of the county of Edessa, an area with a large Armenian population, and he married an Armenian noblewoman named Morphia. Melisend was their daughter, so in other words, she was half Armenian and half Frankish. We know an unusual amount about this manuscript. Frequently, we have to make assumptions about them, but in this case, we have some recorded details. We know that her husband, King Folk, had it commissioned for her as a gift, and we know that it was created in the scriptorium of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where Western Christian, Byzantine, and Armenian Christian scribes put it together. In general, that scriptorium is a good reflection of how these different artistic ideas were exchanged. These varied groups of scribes resulted in art that featured aspects of all of those styles. As these images show you, these manuscript paintings made heavy use of gold leaf as a background, and they also had an increased level of realism. And of course, you can also see the characteristic of wavy clothing. Some aspects of this unique crusader figural art do make their way back to Europe too, and as the Romanesque style transformed into the Gothic style there, the use of the gold leaf and the increasingly realistically proportioned figures can potentially be attributed to the influence of crusader art. So, to sum up, crusader art and architecture was very much influenced by the culture of the crusaders, which was itself a syncretic one that borrowed various aspects of the local cultures and traditions and combined it with those of Western Europe. In this video, we looked at some specific elements where this cultural exchange is visible. In architecture, this resulted in the increased use of central plan structures with domes and the introduction of massive stone fortifications. In art, it resulted in a unique style that emphasized realism in a way that Western Christians were not at the same time. These are just a few examples of how Crusader art and architecture were influenced by the local cultures in the Levant, and if you dig deeper, you'll find even more. That does it for this video. Don't forget to vote on the poll for next week's video. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it so that more people can enjoy it. If you want to make sure you stay aware of future videos, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. And if you want to catch up on some of my other videos, including several others on the Crusades, you should see some playlists on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching.